Good morning. This is Tim Harris with the Harris Real Estate University, and this is the Friday Superstar interview. Now, today's superstar is somebody, let's call him unusual, to be selected as a superstar. What makes him unusual? Well, first of all, he's not in the real estate business. Okay, well, that's kind of unusual, but he, he's not even, a, he's not a realtor. He's not in the real estate business. He's not a lender. And how about this one? This one's kind of scary, but it's true. He's not even American. He's Canadian, for God's sake. Now, why did we choose Jeff Nielsen to be our Friday Superstar interview? Because of all those reasons and the fact that he's a brilliant economist. I've been reading Jeff's writings um, on his website for quite a while, and I've learned quite a few things. It's nice to get an opinions about the economy and housing and the rest of it from someone who doesn't have a dog in the fight. In other words, who, someone who doesn't have an opinion, and what they have to say is having some sort of relationship to the money that they're making. Um, a lot of times in this industry, we are getting opinions from folks that are biased. Uh, let's just do a little be honest, right? If you are a realtor and you listen to what the Real Estate Association has to say about the economy and the housing markets and the rest of it, hopefully you understand that even though they are giving factual information, hopefully, they're spinning it in such a way that would benefit them, that would benefit the housing markets, that would benefit the members of the association. That's their job. When you hear the government reporting numbers about unemployment, about housing starts, and about the rest of it, hopefully you're thinking to yourself, what's their motivation? Why are they telling me this information? Here's the ultimate problem when we are not able to think on our own and we're not able to kind of sift and sort through the Mickey Mouse information that's uh, piled on as fact every single day is that we don't prepare ourselves. We aren't thinking like business people, and then guess what happens? Same thing that happened to literally, well, I mean, I was going to say hundreds of thousands of realtors, but really our whole country and most of the world. Everybody gets caught by surprise because they're not given the information to make a, uh, the correct decisions in preparation for what might be coming next. So, guys, that's the reason I'm so honored to have Jeff on the call today. So, Jeff, welcome to the call. Hi, Tim. It's a real pleasure to be here. And let me also say that I'm uh, very impressed with the work that you and your wife, Julie, are doing on your own site. Okay, I'll make sure I send that PayPal for 50 bucks for saying that, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, oh, by the way, Jeff, meet Julie. You guys haven't spoken before. Yes. Hi, Good Julie. Good to have you on. Hi. Thanks. So, Jeff, let me set this call up. And you and I had – it's interesting, um, guys – Prior to these calls, I usually have a 20 to 30 minute conversation with the superstar just to sort of get an idea of what they like to talk about. This, as all of you know, these superstar interviews are designed to be, well, I'd say more informal and more fun and, you know, kind of just let, let the conversation flow. So when I was talking with Jeff yesterday, he and I stayed on the line for two hours. And the reason we were on the line for two hours is because I was learning so much and I wrote down probably five or six pages of things that he said. And a lot of the things he said I've been thinking about ever since. Um, one of the things that, as a owner of Harris Real Estate University, I have to be focused on is making sure that I'm delivering the best education that I can to all of our students, and that we're not just with the times, but we are way ahead of the times. Um, this is going to sound like bragging, but it's not. We were certainly that way with, when it came to short sales. Uh, certainly REO education, a lot of the other things we're talking about here at Harris Real Estate University. And, guys, I'm looking forward and looking to the horizon now to what might be coming next. So one of the questions that we'd like to ask all of our graduate coaching students, and this is how we're going to start the call, and uh, this is kind of the premise of the call, and uh, hopefully it will help all of you open, have open minds to what's happening now and what might be happening next. So if you knew, here's the question, if you knew for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, all of our graduate coaching students, you should know this question by heart. If you knew for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that things in housing, in the economy on a whole, were not going to get better, they were going to get worse in many aspects or stay the same. In other words, there was not going to be any sort of bounce-back recovery. There wasn't going to be any sort of returning to the glory days of the boom cycle in real estate. If everything that you knew about real estate in terms of buyer habits, in terms of home appreciation, in terms of affordability, in terms of financing, if all that was going to change, if everything was going to change, what would you be doing differently now? What two or three things would you be learning? What two or three things would you stop doing? Many of you are still doing things in your businesses that may have worked in the past market that frankly are just a waste of time and money now. 
have an open mind. If some of the things that Jeff is going to say on this call seem a little bit scary, if you've not been exposed to some of these thoughts before, don't shut them down. Research them more. Learn more. Become dependent on yourself for education. Become dependent on yourself to learn. Um, Jeff and I aren't going to get deep into any conspiracy theories or anything like that, so some of you who already have your filters up, you can go ahead and drop them. The purpose of this call is to 100% prepare you for what is probably going to happen next in housing and the economy on a whole. So, Jeff, did I set the bar too high? Uh, no, you know, it's perfect for, for what I'd hopefully like to accomplish here. You know, it's always exciting to uh, have a chance to uh, interact with a new audience because there are so many things, you know, that we can discuss, which, of course, is why our own conversation uh, ended up dragging on for so long the other day. Uh, you know, I was trying to decide what I'd like to start with in terms of trying to um, introduce some of my own ideas to people. And I guess the best thing I could come up with is if there was one thing people could do to help themselves get a better feel for what is really going on in the economy um, with their own employment situation, with the housing market, it would be to get an understanding of inflation. And unfortunately, that requires a lot more than simply listening to the latest CPI numbers from the government because of the fact that it's a much more complicated topic than uh, such a simple statistic makes it appear. Well, you know what? I uh, wrote that down as one of our questions. And since you brought it up right at the start of the call, you're kind of jumping in the deep end right away. I was going to sort of gingerly walk them down to the deep end. But what the heck? We're here. Let's jump in. So that's actually some – I actually heard – I hate using this term – but another real estate guru say that inflation when it comes to home values is a good thing. Can you address that particular comment from an economist standpoint? It it was exactly a point that I was planning on addressing. Uh, Let's just – you know, take some imaginary numbers here just for the purposes of, of argument's sake. Suppose that we have an environment where inflation is literally right at 0% and housing prices are falling at, say, 5% a year. You know, obviously that's not a situation which any homeowner wants to be in, nor most real estate professionals. Um, we take those same numbers and change them, and now we have an uh, inflation rate of 10%, and house prices rising at an annual rate of 5% a year. Now, if you were to talk to the average person in the street, they would probably much prefer the second scenario to the first scenario. However, in reality, if you discount those home prices by the inflation rate, if you subtract that 10% from home prices, then instead of seeing a 5% rise in the price of your home, in real dollars, you're still seeing the 5% decline. Inflation is simply hiding the pain and, you know, making people feel better about a situation which is every bit as worse as the first scenario I described. So it's, it's, you and I talked about this the other day, and I thought this was very interesting because a lot of people believe that in the United States that there is no inflation. Matter of fact, um, you hear a lot of people say, well, the, the powers that be say, well, we're not worried about inflation. We're in a historic deflationary time. Home values, you know, car values, everything else that's, a, you know, a quote unquote, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, asset, uh, is depreciating. And you are, you made the comment on our pre-call that quite the opposite is true, that there's actually inflation going on. They're just hiding it. Explain that. Well, you know, one of the easiest ways for people to, uh, get caught up on this issue and get, you know, accurate and insightful information would be to go to a website uh, called shadowstats.com run by an economist named John Williams. And he basically has one mission on his site, and that's to calculate uh, all U.S. statistics using the same methodology that was used, say, a generation ago. And, you know, that's important for several reasons. The first reason it's very important is because it provides numbers which are comparable to previous economic periods. The problem we have today, you know, if you want to be charitable, you can uh, say what the government is doing is refining its techniques for analysis. But in reality, it's simply fudging the numbers. Uh, for instance, there are two techniques that have been introduced by the U.S. government over the last several years to alter how they measure inflation. Uh, One example of that is called hedonics. And uh, what hedonics is, is it basically is an attempt by the government to discount the price of something by the amount of quality that has supposedly been added to a good. 
And I used a really simple example with, with Tim previously in our, our uh, chat. And yeah, I pointed Tim, I out how simple examples. Yeah, well, it's best for everybody, you know, easier for us and easier for for these listeners no, as I was well. Quite, I was quite, I was being quite serious, Jeff. <laughs> well, you know, like an example is, suppose you go into your local supermarket and uh, you won't reach for a regular product that you purchase on your shelf, and to your surprise, you see that uh, the manufacturer has put a handle on that project or on that product rather. Well. You know, in reality, it doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference if the package is a handle or not. But in the world of hedonics, the government statistician will look at that and say, you know what, I love that handle. That's, this makes this product so much better. You know, that you know, we're going to consider this product cheaper now simply because of the fact it has this handle on it that makes it much more useful for consumers. So, you know, the government uses that one technique to discount prices with something that can never be measured and which is totally subjective. And so, you know, at best, it's dubious. And, of course, at worst, it's a deliberate attempt to deceive. And a second example of how this is being done is with a technique called substitution. And with substitution, the government looks at items which have increased dramatically in price and says, you know what, these items have gotten so expensive that your average consumer is simply going to stop buying them and buy something else instead. Well, you know, on the surface, that doesn't sound too outlandish, but the problem is is that there's no uh, rhyme or reason to the substitutions they do. For instance, if uh, the government observed that the price of oranges was increasing rapidly, then they would say, okay, well, we're, we're going to assume that the consumers are substituting oranges out of their basket of goods, and they observe that, say, tennis balls have become very cheap. And then they say, okay, well, they're going to stop buying oranges and they're going to buy tennis balls instead. Well, you know, of course, in the real world, tennis balls aren't a substitute for oranges. So, you know, it's creating a deliberate statistical fiction by making a substitution of that nature because you can't justify it in terms of real-world behavior. So you said something on our pre-call, which I thought was very interesting. And actually, uh, I thought about this afterwards and, and found actual examples in my own home where it was true. You said another thing that they do to disguise inflation is they actually, just using the grocery store analogy, staying with that, is they actually reduce the size of the packages and keep the prices the same. Well, this is the, the thing that's happening to the average person in the street, is there's a, a two-pronged assault uh, on our uh, uh, ability to perceive what's going on. Well, you have the government on one side making their dubious adjustments in terms of how they measure inflation, on the other side of the coin, you have manufacturers of, of many you know, common household products doing their own bit to try to hide inflation from consumers. And the favorite technique for manufacturers is to reduce the size of packages rather than to simply increase the price of goods. And once again, you know, we're getting a lot into uh, consumer psychology here, but the fact is is that the average person notices a price increase much more and, and, and react adversely to it than a shrinkage of the package. But here's what's interesting. If you take, uh, a, uh, say, a box of Kraft Dinner and you increase, decrease the size of the package by 10%, uh, that works out to an 11% price increase. So by going the shrinkage route rather than boosting prices, they can actually pass on larger price increases to consumers while, in fact, consumers perceive very little increase in price because when they see a small shrinkage in the size of a package, they, they really don't pay too much attention to it. So you've got this psychological attack by the uh, manufacturers of goods to deceive us with you know, the price increases that they are passing along to us, and you have the government then distorting things even further by taking those numbers and, of course, take, simply subtracting the ones they don't like or, or reducing them through hedonics and then coming up with these you know, ridiculous uh, consumer price index numbers. So um, we're going to draw this full circle, guys. I'm getting some really smart real estate questions that people are entering in, and, and I'm going to kind of draw this back and kind of focus this on housing for the sake of our audience. Sure. Um, who can they listen to? I mean, you, from what you're telling me, essentially the information they're, they're getting out of the, the kind uh, you know, the, the government and a lot of the information. Certainly, a lot of realtors depend on information coming from the National Association of Realtors. And I, I'm sure, I don't imagine you spent much time examining um, their statistical gathering techniques. But who can realtors count on? How can they go about actually uh, 
sifting and sorting through all the various sources of content to decide what what is happening and what will happen next. Well, you know, like I say, um, that site I mentioned, shadowstats.com, is one example, and it's a very you know, good example. But, you know, there are so many places uh, on the Internet where you can find quality information and extremely dedicated people who are, are you know, literally devoted to nothing but, but trying to get the most accurate information possible out to people. And, you know, certainly every month, and I mean sometimes every week, I'm discovering new sources myself. So I think that the short answer would be to encourage people to get on their computers, to get out there on the Internet, and to start, you know, reading up on some of these non-mainstream media sources and, you know, learning what they have to say and educating yourself. You know, it's not an overnight process, but a lot of these sites are very accessible, and it's not as daunting as people might originally think. So this information, when people start to wake up to what really is going on, might seem a little bit scary for some folks that have been reliant on and dependent on um, outside sources for their information. In other words, if the government tells me everything's going good, if the National Association of Realtors tells me everything's going good, and I actually think National Association puts out some pretty strong, accurate numbers, but that aside the point. So if all those things are, are uh, not necessarily as reliable as I would have hoped, um, you know, a lot of these people, a lot of folks listening to this call now and in, and in replay are probably going to feel a little bit lost. I, I suppose that's the first stage in waking up, isn't it? Well, you know, the, the part of the problem also is based on the fact that we've become so much more passive in our thinking. And, you know, in large respect, this is due to the way our educational systems uh, train us. Uh, we're simply not... Uh, being trained to think for ourselves, as you pointed out in the beginning of your show. And, you know, when you take this passivity and you take a government which has a very strong motivations for, you know, hiding the, the exact nature of things, uh, it's a very ugly combination. And, you know, I mean, the short answer, again, is, is be a skeptic. You know, when you, when you hear something, don't simply assume, oh, this is a reliable source, you know, this must be the truth. You know, take your own real-life experiences, take other de data that you've uh, seen from other sources and relate that back to the you know, particular number that's being presented to you and ask yourself, is this realistic? Do I have reasons to doubt that this is you know, perhaps as reliable an estimate as I might first have thought? And you know, if you start getting into that process of automatically challenging facts that are presented to you, you start to, to develop this natural thought process of thinking for yourself, of, you know, calculating things. You know, I mean, not necessarily the way an economist is going to do, but, you know, even in, in rudimentary terms. You know, like I say, getting back to that original example about inflation, you know, so many people, if they saw inflation at 10% and their house rising at an uh, annual rate of 5% in price, are, are simply going to think, oh, yeah, well, my, my house is going up in value again. Well, isn't that, Jeff, isn't that exactly what basically would be being told to them to believe? Isn't well, that that's historically whole, what's happened? That's the whole point. You know, there's a large incentive in the corporate world to have everybody, you know, sort of singing along in the same tune. And, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, groupthink in the media as well. So, I mean, it's not simply a matter of, gee, you know, everybody who's working for, you know, Bloomberg or CNN or Fox News is trying to you know, hide the truth from me, it's more along the lines of you have this group of people who have all been conditioned to rely upon sets of numbers. And, you know, they just accept them without question because, you know, they've been doing that for years and in many cases decades. And so, you know, it doesn't even require dishonesty for this disinformation to, to grow uh, larger and larger as a problem. It simply requires a groupthink mentality where it becomes very easy for authority people to pass along a number they've produced, you know, whether that number is reliable or not, and have it simply accepted at face value. So um, one of the things that, I'm, well, okay, first of all, listeners, I'm looking at your guys' questions coming in. Uh, ben, Beasley, Louise, George, uh, Jerry, all of you guys who have questions, go ahead and enter them into the webinar. I'll definitely use a lot of these questions uh, to uh, when interviewing Jeff. Here's a great question that just came in. So guys, listen, enter your questions in the webinar at any time. As Julie and I say frequently, it's our goal to have the smartest real estate uh, realtors out there, to have the smartest students. And so that's the reason we exposed you to thinking and folks like Jeff. 
Guys, ask questions. If this makes you uncomfortable, if you're hearing things that you haven't thought before, having uh, challenges maybe with some of your beliefs, accept it, open your mind up to it, and at least start taking some steps in the direction of learning to think on your own and learning to be a little bit more of a critical skeptic when it comes to believing some of these core numbers that are delivered to us on a routine basis. So, Jeff, let's let's kind of circle this background so we can focus on housing. I'm reading some of these questions, lots of questions coming in. How did the housing bubble start? I mean, we can certainly talk about all the usual arguments, but from your perspective, how did the housing bubble start? Well, this is another very interesting point. You know, there have been asset bubbles occurring throughout the history of the, the global economy. It's nothing new there. But typically, an asset bubble is created on the demand side. Uh, you know, a market heats up for one reason or another because people see you know, great value or great potential to make money, and you know, buyers pile in. And that uh, buying demand is what fuels the growth of the bubble. And then, of course, the people on the supply side, you know, meet that demand uh, and eventually exceed that demand. What made the U.S. housing bubble so much different from typical asset bubbles previously is this was a bubble that was created on the supply side. In other words, uh, the banks came up with what they call mortgage securitization uh, that developed and took off in the 1990s. And, uh, of course, most real estate people will be familiar with that term. And what it refers to is a bank uh, originates a mortgage with a buyer, and then they immediately sell that mortgage to a third party. And what made this such an important change for the whole complexion of the U.S. real estate sector is that in farming off these mortgages to third parties, the banks were able to convince the regulators, the extremely compliant regulators, that they were reducing risk. And so by supposedly reducing risk, by spreading these mortgages around amongst many other uh, parties and buyers, they were able to increase their leverage dramatically from a, an industry average of around 10 to 1 to an utterly insane level of, of roughly 30 to 1 leverage, which was an average for the U.S. financial sector at the peak of the bubble. And, and what this means, you know, for people that aren't too familiar with this uh, jargon, is banks started off with a fixed amount of money to lend to the U.S. economy. But by tripling their leverage, it essentially made roughly three times as much money available to lend out into the U.S. economy. So this wasn't a matter of buyers, you know, causing a frenzy in the housing sector and then the banks reacting to that by lending out more money. This is a matter of the banks starting with a vast amount of excess capital, which they would love to lend out, and then trying to find people to take that money off their hands. And, of course, what ended up happening is lending standards get uh, dramatically reduced, and uh, a, a speculative market begins to take shape at a much earlier stage than in a typical asset bubble. But the other side of this coin is if you look at at simply the fact that this was a supply-created bubble, you really have to ask yourself if there was not some premeditation here. Because What do you mean? What do you mean by well, that? Well, you know, if you have people with a fixed level of, of wages and a fixed level of wealth, and you suddenly decide that you're going to lend out three times as much money to that same group of people, you know that you're going to be creating an unstable debt bubble because people with a fixed level of income can't suddenly take on three times as much debt without creating these huge risks for default. So, you know, while the banks were pretending and convincing the regulators that they were, in fact, reducing risk, you know, through this mortgage securitization, uh, you know, while originally that might have been true, it very quickly turned out to be the exact opposite case. You had households that were getting uh, leverage to ridiculous extremes by taking on larger mortgages or several mortgages in the cases of speculators. And then you had the financial sector as a whole, you know, while, while the money was spread out amongst more players, the total size of the sector grew by such a tremendous rate that you actually ended up with more risk in the overall financial sector rather than less. So you're creating huge risk on the individual level with you as homeowners, huge systemic risk on the lender's side, and, you know, there was basically no way that the people who were engaging in, in these policies and, and, you know, designing these financial products and selling these derivatives and other products 
could not be aware of what the long-term effect was going to be. Well, so this not only created, it, it put more money in the hands of more folks. It made homes go up artificially in value, obviously, because there was so much increased demand. You know, people weren't just buying one home. They were buying five homes. You know, after all, why wouldn't you want to buy a house? It's like buying a winning lottery ticket. And so, I mean, Jeff, there were millions of houses that were built that I question as to whether or not they'll ever be resold. What do you, you know, I talked to you a little bit about this on the uh, pre-call where you thought that, well, what, what's going to happen to all the excessive inventory? Will, these, will there ever be buyers for all these houses? You know, very early on when I began writing about this, I predicted there would be at least a million homes that were simply bulldozed. Because, uh, you know, when you have millions of homes created strictly for speculators, there's, you know, simply no people to live in those homes when the speculator capital dries up. And so, you know, and the other thing, too, with regard to this bubble being created on the supply side is that it was really irrelevant to the uh, banks who were supplying the money and to the speculators who, who responded to this easy money where these houses were being built. You know, all they were looking for was, you know, something which could be somehow justified as, as a residential investment. And, and, you know, this is where basically these exurbs began to grow across the U.S. and, of course, mostly around the, the hot markets because, you uh, it didn't matter if there was really no people ready to live in these ex or McMansions as long as there were enough speculator dollars to keep them flipping back and forth from one speculator to another. And, of course, now that that, that speculative capital has eased up, it becomes more and more obvious that there was never going to be any people to live in these homes. And, you know, of course, population growth at some point in the future will, will result in enough bodies to, to occupy all of these properties but, I mean, that's an extremely gradual process. And, you know, to establish any sort of a short- or medium-term equilibrium in this market, you have to reduce supply. Well, so I'm, Chris Darney, our coach from the short sale class, asked a great question. I'm going to ask all your guys' questions in a second. So please continue to enter in your questions. So these McMansions, right, all these the, the baby boomers who are building all these huge houses on these tiny little lots, Let's just focus in on that, and I'm going to tell you why, Jeff. Uh, across the country, we're seeing students that are saying in their marketplaces the correction or the depression led, whatever you want to call it, that we're in the middle of. Well, actually, that would be another good question. How far along the cycle do you actually believe we are with regards to housing? I'll ask that one in a second. But so they're saying now that the McMansion homes, the big, huge, ego-type, you know what I'm talking about, that those are the ones that are now seeing the biggest price reductions. Those are the ones that are seeing uh, the potential for the next big, uh, you know, essentially foreclosure mess. And we know from the government that they said that the Alt-A mortgages are the ones now that are starting to default in greater numbers than even the subprimers ever did. What is the future for all those millions of these McMansions that are across the country? Will there? Does it make sense that those houses will ever go up in value again, and, and let's just say for the sake of conversation, ever the next 20 years? Well, you know, of course, when we talk about going up in value, once again, we get back to the issue of whether you're talking about uh, increasing in nominal value or increasing in real dollars. Uh, when it comes to real dollars, you know, I would say that, that the answer is very simple. You know, there's, there's no possibility of, of these houses appreciating in value over that time horizon, you know, not just for the reasons that you've listed, but for, you know, a whole long list of additional reasons. And it's all of these additional reasons that are what makes this situation so scary because you have, you know, the mainstream media focusing in on, you know, monthly changes and one or two statistics and saying, okay, well, look, we've hit a bottom. And they're just it's just so superficial. It's just not coming close to examining the, the real picture. For instance, you mentioned the baby boomers. And, of course, you know, now the baby boomers are starting to retire. Well, those retirements are grossly underfunded. Uh, you know, as of last fall when things got really bad in the markets, I read that U.S. baby boomers were basically facing a shortfall in their pensions of roughly $3 trillion dollars. And, you know, of course, that's improved somewhat with the rebound in markets, but they're still facing a very large shortfall in order to maintain a similar standard of living to what they've had prior to their retirement. So for these baby boomers, you know, 75% of their assets is real estate. 
And if they've still got to raise, you know, one or two trillion dollars just to keep their standard of living, uh, you know, roughly equivalent to where it was before, you know, think about how much real estate these people alone are going to be dumping onto the market over that 20 year time frame. Well, that's the big trend right now. And, and a lot of them, as people in their early 50s, it seems that's where it's kind of starting as far as age demographics based on the free coaching calls with the, that we do with our students. And uh, they can't find buyers for them. And your point being that, well, a lot of these uh, poor people had, well, I say poor in quotes, but a lot of these unfortunate folks who had come to be reliant on their home equity as part of their retirement plan are now waking up to the reality that not only is there no home equity, but in many cases the house is worth significantly less than they owe on it. And that's a massive shift in the way people are thinking about housing. So leading that forward, what do you think, what are the big macro trends that are coming for housing in the United States? What do you, again, let's just say for the next five to ten years. Well, you know, the one, of course, was, like I say, that with regard to the baby boomers and their retirement problem, uh, of course, the, the next thing to point out, even more immediate, is that uh, we're currently just in a brief lull between the end of the last spike in mortgage resets from all of those uh, ARM mortgages and the next spike, which is going to be t- lasting even longer uh, for roughly two years, although it's not going to be quite as, as steep a spike as the first one. And... You know, it's simply inevitable that if you have all of these mortgage resets on the horizon, and in most cases, resets to higher, you know, mortgage rates and, and higher monthly payments, that, you know, this must lead to a second wave of defaults. And, you know, so, I mean, that's been something that's been sitting there, you know, right from when the housing bubble first burst. So, for instance, you know, at the beginning of 2007, you know, they already knew that, you know, when 2010 rolled around, there was going to be this next wave of mortgage resets, you know, putting real stress on household budgets. So, you know, what what is somewhat infuriating to people such as myself is that the mainstream media completely ignores these types of, of factors. You know, it was sitting there the entire period, but, you know, how often when people were, when, sorry, journalists were, you know, speculating about whether the market had bottomed, were they including this cloud that was hanging on the horizon? You know, very rarely from what I've read myself. Well, exactly. And that's what, on the net, that's one of the things I've definitely focused on in the blog. I've noticed other, I was sort of following the footsteps of other bloggers. And, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. No one was really talking about what was coming next. Everybody was sort of drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, the housing hit, has hit bottom, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, you and I have talked about numbers. Um, there was a government report that came out that said there were 13 million bank-controlled homes, essentially homes that are headed towards foreclosures. And then there's another report that came out, uh, I think it was late last week, that said, including vacation rentals, so full disclosure, that uh, and I'm sorry, vacation rentals, vacation homes, third homes, things of that nature, that there's 19 million vacant single-family homes in the United States. Now, you know, the bottom line is, is there is an epic wave of multiple waves of foreclosures that are still coming. So to think that the housing markets have hit bottom, I think it's reasonable, Jeff, and and you don't have to agree with me, obviously, but it's reasonable to maybe hope (laughs) that housing in certain price ranges in certain markets have hit bottom, or do you not agree with that? Well, I think that's one of the things that is going to materialize, is that, uh, you know, with the large correction that's already taken place in this market, there are going to be segments of, you know, relative health, you know, and I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean prices are going to go up in real terms, but where you may not have as much downside risk in terms of of the overall deterioration that's going to be uh, coming in this market. So, yes, uh, lower priced units, of course, is the classic example because, uh, you know, in our pre-chat, you were talking about how the era of conspicuous consumption is ending. Well, of course, you know, a natural manifestation of that is going to be downsizing in homes from, you know, the three-bedroom, three-bathroom, you know, 3,000 square feet jobs, you know, down to, you know, more modest bungalows. Jeff, what are you saying? 3,000 square feet in the United States, that is a bungalow. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess I'm guess i guess I, I'm going... Uh, Back a bit a little bit further in terms of, of house sizes, but you know I, I'm not a real estate professional, so I well, don't. Well, what you're, what you're, I know, I'm just kidding. What you were referring to is kind of one of the 
I'd say macro trends that we've been telling students to be aware of for the past few years is the fact that the day the conspicuous consumption bling bling type, you know, lifestyle is not only over for financial reasons, but it's over just because people don't want to live that way anymore. So for all the, it's kind of ironic, maybe the two are hand in hand, but the baby boomers inability to afford to maintain their uh, conspicuous lifestyles it sort of goes hand-in-hand hand with the fact that, guess what, it's no longer going to be trendy, too. So that kind of worked out, I think. <laughs> now, what came first, the uh, lack of ability to pay for it or the uh, changes in the trends? I don't know. But regardless, guys, in your marketplaces, you need to be aware of what we're talking about. So, Jeff, when he's talking, when Jeff's talking about uh, shifts and preferences towards housing, so, Jeff, out will be the expensive to maintain, you know, multi-thousand square foot homes, and in will be... In will be uh, smaller homes, but also homes that are closer to uh, employment centers. And, you know, whether that means the revitalization of, uh, you know, uh, more urban environments or whether it simply means uh, that, you know, closer suburbs are going to go from single-family units to more multifamily units, I think you're going to see that sort of consolidation. You know, people are going to be pulling in not only in terms of the size, of the uh, housing units they're living in, but also in terms of uh, reducing that commuting distance to cut down on transportation costs and, of course, cut down on transportation time to improve quality of life. In other words, it's not going to be so much a matter of necessarily pursuing higher wages and greater wealth as the key to happiness in the future, but looking for ways, non-monetary ways, in which people can improve their quality of life. So you and I on our pre-call were talking about um, a lot of the uh, things that people have become reliant on, I would say probably Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, Social Security, and all those types of things. What do you think? Do you think those programs will be able to exist in their current form? Continued. Well, th- this is th- the ultimate nightmare for the American public, and you know, I'm sorry to speak in such frightening terms, but there's no other way to describe it. Uh, not only are the uh, U.S. entitlement programs facing these massive deficits, and you know you now hear estimates of anywhere from 70 trillion to 100 trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities. What does that by, mean? Unfunded liabilities. Unfunded liabilities are basically a cute way of saying the government has taken all of these future bills, which they know are going to come due and which they have no way of paying for, and simply move them off of the balance sheet. You know, and I pause there just to allow people to contemplate, you know, what a frightening idea that is. Imagine yourself as an individual with your own household budget. If you simply took your largest expenses and said, you know what, there's no way that I'm ever going to be able to pay for these in the future. So I'm just going to forget about them. <laughs> you know, that that is not a way to manage a household. And, of course, it's certainly not a way to manage a government. But that's exactly what's happening. So that's, you know, one, one part of it is the U.S., Uh, government knows there are these massive payouts coming for Social Security, for Medicare, for other programs, you know, in the years and decades ahead. And there's there's no money being put aside now for it. There are no revenues that are going to be created to pay for it. So these, quote, unquote, unfunded liabilities, this, you know, um, web of, of benefit programs, which many Americans think they're going to be relying on in their later years, are simply you know, either going to be scaled back radically or eliminated altogether. But, you know, it's not even it's, – it's actually worse than that. It's not simply a matter of these looming bills not being addressed. U.S. politicians are regularly pillaging the trust funds, which these entitlement programs have as nest eggs to supposedly ensure that benefits will be available. In the last 17 years, the U.S. government has pillaged – Four trillion dollars from various trust funds, more than two trillion dollars from a Social Security trust fund alone. So, so while the, you basically what you're saying is that the government, in order to fund all of its expenses and continue spending like it is spending, uh, is borrowing or stealing money. Because borrowing would be, I think, the wrong way to say it because they don't ever pay it back. I mean, I've never heard of them paying it back. Have you? No, it's clearly stealing money because yeah. not only um, are, have they not paid a penny of it back, there aren't even any provisions in future budgets to repay this money. You so, know, when you so, yeah. Well, let me just throw this. I don't know if you paid attention to this, Jeff. You probably did. But in California, 
Um, there was a, something that passed that evidently had kind of snuck through in this last budget bill in the state of California that everyone in California is going to have their state withholding tax increase, Jeff, by 10%. Now, technically, it's not a tax hike because what is, how this is written is that the uh, state of California gets the use of that added 10% and they'll give it back to you, you know, provided that you don't owe taxes come April. But essentially, they're going to be withholding I don't know what word you want to use, but stealing an additional 10%. Nobody voted on it. People haven't talked about it. People are just waking up in California to realize that this is now the way it's going to be. 10% additional out of people's pockets at the same time that homes are going down in value, at the same time that you know inflation is creeping back into things and things are costing more even with getting less. That's, that's essentially what you're talking about that the government's been doing with Social Security. Well, yes, and, and of course it's happening not just in California, but in other states as well. And of course in California, they're doing this, uh, you know, borrowing from the future in many ways. Uh, for instance, I don't know if they've actually been sold yet or not, but I mean, there's certainly been a lot of talk in recent months about quote unquote revenue anticipation warrants. That they're going to raise billions of dollars, uh, because they are going to have all the surplus funds in the future that they can use to pay, retire that debt. And, of course, there's no indication of there being any surplus funds in the future. Rather, the situation just looks more and more bleak the farther you go out, unless, of course, you start putting in all of these unrealistic forecasts of a, a huge rebound in the economy. Is there any historical perspective of any of this type of you know, political maneuvering with regards to taxpayers' money. Has this ever happened? I mean, even on a global perspective? Because some of this stuff just seems so ridiculous when I listen and read uh, different things on just different sources of information. I can't believe that, frankly, people aren't up in arms in California about this added 10% tax hike, even though it's technically not a tax hike. Has there ever been anything like this has happened in history? Well, you know, it's... Of course, uh, that's a pretty broad question. I don't think I know, I, I, on purpose. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm quite quite enough of a historian to be able to provide you with a definitive answer there. I would say that in in the modern era, that there has never been a situation like this where such a large economy and such a uh, supposedly wealthy economy has had to engage in so much uh, desperation measures, so much fudging of numbers, and you know it all gets down to the fact that over the last uh, one and a half, two generations, the United States allowed itself to live a dangerous delusion, which is, you know, the quote unquote, that deficits don't matter. And, you know, that was, I mean, the ultimate foolish uh, means of squandering prosperity is to simply say that, you know, we can borrow as much money as we want year after year. You know, because we're rich and powerful, and we'll always be able to repay it at some point. You know, and of course, that argument should sound fairly ludicrous to people, even when you first mention it. But you know, in initial stages, it at least has some element of plausibility because people were seeing the U.S. government borrow large amounts of money, but also seeing their prosperity increase. And you know, this is basically what you see in the beginning of any Ponzi scheme. You know, the People who originally part of the scheme, you know, benefit as money starts flowing in, and then it's only in the latter stages that people, first of all, realize that this isn't sustainable, and that secondly, the losses start to materialize as the scheme falls apart. And okay, Jeff, we, we we better reverse direction here because I'm getting starting to get comments in on the webinar that some of these people are beginning to look for the cyanide capsules. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, it's easy to sort of uh, go down that path, but I think what's important is that we let folks know essentially what, kind of like where you and I were talking yesterday or the day before with regards to sort of what they can be doing to prepare personally uh, for what's coming next and also what they can be doing and where they can make money in real estate. Because the fact is, is that, guys, the beautiful thing about the industry that we're in is regardless of uh, how severe things might get, there will always be people that want to buy or sell real estate, regardless. And, you know, it's incredible if you guys – I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but 
you can be in the real estate business and get a license that's relatively easy and then have millions and millions of dollars of inventory to sell that you're making a nice little margin on. And so this is a beautiful business to be in because of all the reasons that Jeff's talking about. Some of you, I'm reading your comments, some of you are getting depressed because of what you're saying, but what he's saying, but think about this. So a lot of you guys joined Harris Real Estate University to learn about short sales, how to take REOs, a lot of the things that uh, the tools you need to know for what's coming now and obviously what's coming next. So here it is, guys. Here's the reason why Julie and I have been it is so emphatic about you learning these things because we had been studying these trends since, frankly, we got into real estate. We read a great book by Harry S. Dent called The Great Boom Ahead back in the early 90s. And Harry was predicting that these trends would happen. If you want to read a great book, guys, read that one. And he wrote out, I wrote another one recently called The Great Depression Ahead. But this information has been out there forever. Uh, it's just it was up to you to pick up the pieces along the way and sort of do your business planning. But the fact that you're listening to this call right now, guys, don't be depressed. The fact that you're listening to this call tells me that you're probably a Harris Real Estate University student. You're probably already uh, making money uh, using the tools this new market requires. So, Jeff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of start wrapping the call up. And I want to leave these guys with some ideas of how they can be preparing. First of all, someone did ask a question. Actually, five or six people asked this question. What is the ultimate outcome, right? So you have either inflation, or as some people refer to it as hyperinflation, or you have default. So in essence, when you have guys, when you have a government that has the ability to print money, they can print money and more money and more money and more money, and that is creates hyperinflation or inflation. Or they can just decide not to pay their bills. Jeff, did I explain that correctly? Well, you know, uh, once again, I, I hate to be the voice of doom and gloom here, but the reality is that you can actually have both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is what is really what people should be preparing themselves for today is this dichotomy, uh, elements of inflation and elements of deflation existing simultaneously. On the inflation side, you know, outside of the U.S., uh, I mean, this may not be a huge consolation to, to your listeners, but outside of the U.S., the global economy in general is still in the early stages of this massive new economic boom as the populations of China and India and Brazil and all of these other quote-unquote developing countries to finally make the move into middle-class status for greater and greater numbers of their populations. Like and we did after World War II, like the United States did after World War II, basically like the United States and Europe and, you know, a few other countries that went along for the ride. But what's interesting is that that economic boom, which, you know, many people think lasted for, you know, four years or even longer, was based on an amount of population only 10% as large as the amount that's taking part in this next growth cycle. So In Asia, right? In, in Asia and, and other developing countries. So, you know, while it would be somewhat reckless to say that we're going to see a boom 10 times as large as that previous economic boom. What we are going to see is something that either lasts longer than that uh, post-World War II economic boom or something that is simply bigger. And, you know, so there are going to be tremendous global opportunities to invest in growth stories, you know, in markets outside of the U.S. The growth stories inside the U.S. are going to be much harder to find and they're going to be more modest simply because of this large overhang of debt, which is a, a millstone around the neck of the U.S. economy. And, uh, and of course, you know, for myself personally, uh, I've latched on to precious metals as, as a primary investment vehicle because of the fact that gold and silver can perform a dual role in a period such as this we're entering right now. On the inflation side, they naturally prosper in, in an inflationary environment because they're what quote unquote stores of wealth that you know maintain their value when everything else is is being depreciated. But the other side of the coin is with this huge overhang of debt that doesn't exist only in the United States but also in many other developing economies, there's going to be a greater and greater questioning of the overall solvency of the financial system. You know, we have passed a short term crisis you know, which began last year. But nothing's been solved. The the ultimate day of reckoning for all of these massive bubbles of debt that are overhanging a lot of developed economies is still ahead of us. And as people become more and more dubious about the value of their paper money, again, 
gold and silver thrive and prosper in such an environment. So, you know, this is what, you know, sort of inadvertently brought me into this sector was the fact that uh, these forms of investments, you know, serve the dual purpose of being a protection for deflationary uh, asset bubbles bursting and also protection for high inflation, which is going to be coming with commodities, uh, our food, you know, our clothing, and and other such uh, consumables. So here's what I heard you say, and I I like to leave folks in – I'm going to answer as many of your questions, guys, as you can. Jeff, do you mind if we go a little bit over the hour? No, I've got plenty of time. That's fine. All right. So if you are listening to this call, let's give them some action items here. First of all, pay off your debt, right? Get in the guys, long-time Harris Real Estate University students, you know this. We've been telling you this forever. Live debt-free. Debt-free includes your house. In many cases, as you listen to this call now and then replay, that might not be feasible. You might be so far upside down in your house that it doesn't really matter. You need to look at the alternatives you have to make it so that you are uh, living on vastly less per month. That does mean, I mean, guys, remember the superstar interview we did with Valerie Fitzgerald. She's one of the top agents in the country. She's in Beverly Hills. This lady was making almost $10 million a year in commission. And she said on that interview, I, you know, I'm not going to keep my Bentley. I'm not going to keep this big cons- uh, conspicuous lifestyle. I'm going to downsize. And then she also said, if you guys remember, that everyone she is doing business with, all the celebrity types and all the other, you know, quote unquote, really wealthy people, they're doing the same thing. The trends have moved away from this big bling bling lifestyle. So it, it's giving you permission to to downsize. It's giving you permission to right size. It's giving you permission to get rid of, of all your excessive spending. And that will help you to obviously pay off your debt, but also start saving money. Now, Jeff has said a couple things with regards to investing. Not something we talk about a lot, but, you know, well, by the way, Jeff, what's your website? It's called bullionbullscanada.com. Bullionbullscanada.com. And how do you spell your first and last name? Uh, J-E-F-F. N I E L S O N. So, Jeff, you are saying invest in gold because obviously gold has a 5,000 year track record of being something that's a, a viable investment. When things go sour, people buy gold. And the other thing that's interesting about gold in particular is that the Asian cultures look at uh, gold more than just a store of wealth. I mean, they look at it as it's a cultural, uh, has cultural value. I don't know if, I'm sure you know about it, right? Am I well, stating this correctly? Yeah. For example, uh, India has traditionally been the largest gold importer among all of the nations of the world. Uh, part of the reason they've needed to import so much gold year after year for their society is they have a huge peasant population, uh, hundreds of millions of people, and a, a very large chunk of these people have no access to traditional banks. So, you know, when they acquire some surplus and some savings over the years, you know, they can't you know, walk to the corner and uh, make a deposit in their, you know, Bank of America outlet or whatever. So instead, their wealth is stored in gold jewelry or silver jewelry. And so, you know, people talk about how India has a huge jewelry market, but in fact, what it really means is that the gold and silver market has essentially been a substitute for an actual banking system for much of the peasant population of India. And, you know, that exists in other Asian countries as well. And then, of course, you know, even more in general terms, these countries never accepted the uh, uh, prognostication that gold was a quote-unquote barbarous relic, as it was branded a couple of decades ago. Uh, These countries always viewed gold as the best form of currency and as a great strategic asset, and that was something that was forgotten about in the West. And as we see uh, global wealth shift from West to East, and, you know, with most wealth growth in the world going to be taking place in Asia and, you know, a few other developing nations for the next several decades, the fact that these nations have a strong attachment to gold, strong appetite for gold, is going to mean, you know, very strong support for gold prices, you know, going off into you know many years in the future. And you want to just, throw a number out, by the way? Well, I was just going to say, you know, <laughs> mentioning once again shadowstats.com and, and John Williams, uh, he recently calculated that if you were to use real inflation numbers over the last few decades, that the previous 1980 high, which was set by gold of you know, a little over $700, 
would translate to about seven thousand dollars today. If Peter seven thousand dollars an ounce. Yeah, it's seven thousand. Peter Schiff was speculating that in the short run, it's. I think I haven't checked today, but I guess it's close to eleven hundred now. And then in the short run, he thinks it's going to go up to 1500 and then he said within months go up to 2500 And, and uh, other people have said that realistically, you know, within the next 12 to 24 months, it could go up to 5000 an ounce. I mean, that's a pretty amazing amount of appreciation. But realistically, based on historical perspectives, guys, that's what could happen. And you can hold gold. Uh, well, go to, Jeff's, go to Jeff's website. What's the site again, Jeff? BullionBullsCanada.com. There you go. So go to Jeff's website, learn more about gold. He's the expert on that. Um, a few more questions that I just got, got in while we were talking. Actually, I'm kind of surprised. I, I should say pleased by a lot of the comments and questions. You guys are really getting it. I, I definitely appreciate the fact that you're opening your minds and you, you weren't uh, just tuning out because some of this stuff seems so scary. So, Jeff, as a realtor, right? So let's just bring it right back down to Main Street. As a realtor, small business owner, um, you know, maybe they're in a situation where they too need to rebuild some of their wealth, some of their retirement savings. Where should their focus be in their businesses? Which, what major trends are coming next for housing? We've, t- we've touched on this throughout the call, but in your opinion, you know, this is true for the United States and I suppose for Canada. Where should my focus be as a realtor? Well, you know, I, I think actually, you know, you pretty well answered your own question to me in, in our pre-chat when when you mentioned that you were placing a focus on selling homes to people as places to live. And, you know, that remark really struck me, and I think, you know, that's a theme that, you know, you can probably stick with because that would seem to be the operative dynamic going forward. Uh, you know, where are places where you can have a good school for your kids, you know, that are, are close to various other facilities, uh, you know, nice, safe neighborhoods that are crime-free, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so, I mean, you know, like I say, I, I think that you can probably – give a lot more guidance to your your listeners in that respect than I can. And, you know, I guess basically it's just a matter of changing your perspective to a more realistic set of parameters that are you know, reflective of what's actually taking place as opposed to the, the don't worry, be happy message that you're getting from most of the mainstream media, which is that things are going to be going back to the way they were before. Things are not going to be as they were before you know, for most people, that means there's going to be declines in their standards of living, but you know, it certainly doesn't have to be, uh, you know, the ultimate Armageddon scenario. You know, I think for people that would like to get this message in a more positive uh, context, uh, somebody who's been a tremendous influence to me is a gentleman named Chris Martinson, and uh, he's put together a presentation which he calls his crash course. It's a set of 20 videos, which you know is simply the, the best overview of the global economy and specifically the U.S. economy that I've ever seen in my life. And you know he talks about many of the things I talk about that you know I'm you know phrasing it in fairly frightening terms. And he continually refers to these changing parameters as, as opportunities. So for people that would like to get a very similar message and expressed, you know, in wonderfully clear terms that everybody can can access, you know, Chris Martinson is a great uh, source of of a more positive, you know, framing of this message. Well, but the bottom line is, is if they're doing short sales, if they're doing REOs, if they're focusing on where the market's going to be, if you're trying to decide where to invest your real estate business, guys, Use this information that we're giving you. Go out and get your own information. And remember, uh, don't just blindly follow any guru. A guru wants to take the power away from you. Um, you need to recognize the fact that a lot of people out there want to keep you dumb. They want to keep you asleep. That's not what we're about. We want to give you the information, even if sometimes it's a little controversial, sometimes it's a little scary, so that 12 months from now or 24 months from now, you guys are saying, thank God I listened because now I'm in a position where I don't have to worry about money anymore. So many of our longtime Harris Hill State University graduate students, you guys are in that situation. You're in the position where you don't have any fears because you were ahead of the curve. Now, the rest of you that are coming to the uni- university, you still have time to adjust except the fact that this is just a a time of change, an epic time of change. It's more than just the economy, guys. It's the change and the shifting in people's, uh, their willingness to spend money, what they're expecting out of their lives, where they want to live, how they want to live. 
tune into that. Start listening to what people are saying. Your friends, you, what are you feeling? What are you knowing is that, that is, is changing in your own life? Guys, that is what's going to continue to happen in the United States. Somebody asked Jeff, how does you know the United States look 10 years from now in comparison to, say, like China or you know, some of these other countries in the East that are having so much growth? Do we lose our superpower status? Oh, sorry, are you asking me that one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it would be the best thing in the world for Americans as a people if the U.S. was to, you know, somewhat abandon that status. Because, uh, you know, I hate to sort of get too much into the political side of things, but if you're going to get your economic house in order, you know, the, the key thing is to eliminate non-productive spending. And, <laughs> you know, when you look at non-productive spending, uh, the money that's spent fighting wars, uh, stationing armies, in, you know, in more than 100 countries all over the world, you know, that doesn't help anybody put bread on their table. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who who love all this geopolitical talk and will say, well, yes, you know, we need to be here and we need to be there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if it, it's a lot less expensive to run a country if you don't have to, uh, you know, constantly bill yourself as the world's policeman. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it's it's the difference between having the gold in the vault versus being the guy who's guarding the vault. I mean, we've been the guy that's guarding the vault now for, what, a long darn time. So now it's about time that we shift what we're actually doing and how we're positioned in the country, in the world. And, guys, we do that on a micro level, individually. Susie from San Diego asked a great question. Where do you buy gold? All the dealers charge such a large commission. Well, you know, if you've got a fairly large investment portfolio, you can go directly to where the dealers buy it. You can go to the Comex and you can buy your gold uh, at this, you know, the same price that those dealers are paying for it. Of course, you have to have tens of thousands of dollars, you know, in order to purchase a Comex contract, and you know that puts it out of range to a lot of average investors. But you know, that's the short answer if you want to buy gold at zero premium. You know, you pretty well have to go to the direct sources, the actual international warehouses, whether it's in, in New York or London or Hong Kong, and buy from the exchanges. Other than that, you know, I mean, I'm not a large investor myself. You know, I'm paying these premiums when I choose to purchase gold or, or silver as well. So, you know, for me, I, I console myself with the fact that while, you know, those premiums may hurt in, in terms of how much I can actually afford to buy today, when I look back 10 years from now or even five years from now and you know, think about what prices I paid for my gold or my silver, even including those premiums, those prices are going to look very cheap. It's so, kind of ironic that somebody makes their living off commission is worried about other people making commission, too. I don't know if you missed that. <laughs> well, no, but, no you, you know, offense, they're, <laughs> they're commission conscious, and they don't like that's, the idea of excessive commission. That's right. Ben Beasley from Salt Lake uh, City asked a great question. If you follow Kitco, silver is even more undervalued than gold. Ask Jeff what he thinks about silver undervaluation. Well, you know, here you have one of my own favorite themes. Uh, on our site, you know, we don't directly favor one over the other, but certainly we've pointed out that, you know, the current parameters make silver a much more attractive value. Two basic components here. First of all, there's the price ratio between gold and silver. Now, uh, to backtrack a little further, in the Earth's crust, the element of gold or rather the element of silver, is roughly 17 times more common than the element of gold. And if you go back throughout the entire recorded history of society, you know, nearly 5,000 years where we have been, you know, mining and extracting gold and silver for ourselves, the average price ratio over that, you know, huge length of time is roughly 15 to 1, fairly close to the natural occurrence of the two elements. Well, you look at the prices today, and we're looking at a ratio of 60 to 1. So, I mean, just that skewing of ratios alone, you know, makes silver a very attractive buy. But the other thing which very few people are, are aware of is that because silver is used so much as a quote-unquote industrial metal, unlike gold, uh, silver is being consumed every day. You know, I don't mean people are eating it, um, but in many of the industrial applications, it's used in such small quantities that it's never economically practical to recycle that silver. So essentially that silver is gone forever. Conversely, this almost uh, 
is unheard of with respect to gold. There's basically no industrial applications of gold which result in the same depletion of stockpiles. So, you know, while in the Earth's crust there's 17 times as much as silver as gold, in terms of what's available above the ground, the largest estimate I've heard is that there's about six times as much silver as gold. And I've heard some commentators suggest that gold might actually be more plentiful than silver in terms of what's actually around in the world uh, available in above-ground stockpiles. So if you've got a 60 to 1 price ratio and maybe a 6 to 1 supply ratio, you know, that's another example of, of how totally skewed, you know, the price is in favor of gold right now. So how would you suggest people buy gold? Would you suggest they buy it in bullion, holding coins, or uh, you know, stocks in mining companies? What would you suggest? Well, you know, here's, you know, once again, uh, something to, to perhaps scare people a bit, but hopefully it's of a benefit to them. I, I warn people to stay away from the bullion ETFs. Yeah, and bullion ETFs are not the same as holding the coins. In ETF no, these, is, are, these are exchange-traded funds, and they're based on the premise that people can buy a unit of their fund, and for each unit they purchase, whether it's a, a silver bullion ETF or a gold bullion ETF, that that fund will in turn purchase one ounce of gold or one ounce of silver you know, to, re to represent that unit. The problem is that there's very little in the way of guarantees that these companies are actually fully backed with the amount of bullion they claim to be backed. And I, I don't know, do, you, do I have a couple minutes to get into this? Is that a problem? Uh, well, I, haven't, I, I watched the numbers during the call to see if anybody's hang, uh, hanging up. Uh, hanging up is obviously a bad sign, and I've literally not had anyone hang up. I've had people jumping on the call during the call, so continue. They like it. Okay, well, you know, on the short side of the gold and silver market, you have these bullion banks, which have these massive positions, bigger than any short positions in any other commodity in the history of markets. And they're only required to post 10% of the physical metal to represent the size of that position. So there's these massive short positions held by these bullion banks on these uh, gold, future, gold and silver futures markets. These are the same bullion banks who claim to be backing all of the bullion ETFs. So, for instance, if you take uh, the, the most popular ETF, GLD, and, you know, you look at, at its uh, uh, perspectives, they'll talk about how the, the, the uh, bullion holdings are audited. And, you know, in fact, you'll actually be able to see pictures with serial numbers and things like that. The problem is, even if the, the, the ETFs themselves are audited and they can show that the bullion banks are actually holding enough gold to satisfy that particular obligation as custodian, the short positions are never audited. And, you know, by rather strange coincidence, these short positions are very similar in size to the total holdings of ETFs. So what you actually have is bullion banks with two gigantic uh, guarantees for the market, one that they can back their short positions, and two that they can simultaneously back all these bullion ETFs but only one half of those requirements are ever audited. So, you know, this is what should be scaring people who are in these bullion ETFs is that if there ever is a squeeze, you know, in the gold or silver market, and, of course, there's been rumors of several very close calls in the last few months, which are these bullion banks going to back? Are they going to back their own short positions or are they going to honor their custodian agreements? And, you know, my personal view is that they're going to back their own short positions and they're going to default on these custodian agreements at some point in the future. And ultimately, all the people that are holding these bullion ETFs are going to be holding is paper. So if you want to have gold or silver, buy gold or silver. I know that there are storage costs involved. I know that this is something that people hate to be confronted with. But, you know, that's the way to own gold and silver as a means of securing your financial future. So the just to, thing, to break it down, Jeff, you're saying literally buy gold as in the shiny gold stuff and silver as the shiny silver stuff, and you can buy the coins, you can buy the bars and all of that, and then and you, can, you take physical possession of it. They send it to you, and you wire them the money. They send it to you, and then you can uh, then you store it someplace—a safe deposit box, a safe, who knows where. But the fact is, is that having physical possession of it, either in your direct control or your slightly indirect control, be it a you know a lockbox someplace, 
that is the safest way to own the metal. That That is the only way to own it as far as that component goes. Now, the other side of it is, you know, the, the companies that produce these commodities essentially provide natural leverage to the commodity itself. And, you know, for instance, if you're a gold miner and you're producing gold and it's costing you, say, $900 an ounce for every ounce of gold you produce and you're selling it at $1,000 an ounce, that means that you're making $100 an ounce profit on every ounce of gold. Well, if the price of gold goes from $1,000 an ounce to $1,100 an ounce and you're still producing it at $900, all of a sudden these gold mining companies' profits have doubled even though the price of gold only increased by 10%. So, you know, naturally, a company whose profits double, you know, are going to appreciate in value at a much greater rate. So the thing with precious metals is that you can have a dual strategy in terms of these investments. You can have your physical gold and your physical silver as the ultimate form of security, storage of wealth, you know, protecting your assets. And for, for growth opportunities, you can put an additional component of, of money you have into these precious metals miners with a chance for leverage gains and with the knowledge that these are companies that have real hard assets backing their value. So, you know, while, you know, shares of mining companies are still paper, you know, I would argue that they're a very desirable form of paper in the current environment. What are your favorites? Favorite miners? Yep. Well, you know, that uh, gets to be a little bit of a tricky question because these are very volatile companies. And, you know, personally, I've chosen to go into the uh, junior miners, the smaller companies, because these are the companies that have the greatest growth opportunities. I hate to simply pull out one or two names because if you're going to invest in these smaller companies, you need to buy a basket of them. You need to diversify because, you know, any individual company, you know, there are risks involved. Uh at, you know, I think probably the best thing for me to, to do would be to point out a couple of, of names of companies that I don't hold that, uh, you know, I would like to hold so I don't sort of get into this conflict of interest issue. And uh, for silver, there's a very interesting company called Silver Wheaton, and it has listings in both Canada and the U.S., and Silver Wheaton doesn't mine gold. What it does is it buys – or sorry, silver, silver – doesn't mine silver. It buys – the silver production of other mining companies. So, for instance, a lot of times a company will be mining gold and it produces maybe you know 10% of silver as a byproduct, which doesn't really do it any good in terms of, of making it more attractive to investors. So it'll sell all of that silver production both now and in the future to Silver Wheaton for a fixed price, generally about uh, one-third of the current spot price. And then Silver Wheaton turns around and sells that silver on the open market and makes its profits. So Silver Wheaton gives you all the leverage of a miner, but without the operating risks of running a mine, you know, for instance, some sort of an accident in the mine or, you know, changes in labor costs or changes in fuel costs, you know, that can impact your bottom line. Silver Wheaton avoids those problems because it's not an actual miner, but still gives you the profile of a miner. On the gold side, you know, there are so many uh, junior gold miners that have uh, wonderful prospects, you know, both now and in the future. Um, gee, you know, I, I c couldn't, even, couldn't even list one. Um, they should go to your website probably, which is, again? BullionBullsCanada.com. Yeah, we have a, a growing database of companies there. There's dozens of, of summaries for mining companies where people can get an introduction to these. And, and if you do go to my site, I've actually – uh, written a few pieces recently to give people some general ideas on how to shop for these companies. So there you go, guys. As promised, this was going to be somebody different. The superstar for today, Jeff, has done a, I think, excellent job of explaining to all of us where the opportunities are now in our industry and where they are really going forward. And guys, I'm going to continue to intentionally expose you to folks like Jeff, and maybe I'll even have Jeff back for a second interview. What matters most is that you start to think on your own two feet, that you stop just drinking the Kool-Aid and believing the information that's being shoved down your throat with regards to what's happening in the economy. Guys, you know what's going on if you just trust your intuition, if you just frankly walk out your front door, how many vacant houses there are. If you look at your own investment portfolio, how much are those stocks worth now? 
What do you think is happening next? Don't be so reliant on other people leading the way for you. Go out and gather your own information and make your own decisions. You don't need to be pessimistic about the housing industry, about real estate, or about the United States. You need to be opportunistic and focused on where their opportunities are to help others and make money. Guys, there's massive shifts that we're living through right now, historical shifts that, who knows, 100, 200, 300, 400 years from now, they're going to look back upon and maybe refer to as one of the greatest shifts of any Western civilization. That's what we're living through now. Guys, the greatest fortunes are always made during the greatest times of change. Think about where the trends are and by all means, go out of your way. Be aggressive about getting the education that's necessary so that you're prepared for what's happening next. Use your brains, guys. That's the most powerful tool you'll ever have. So, Jeff, I'll let you wrap the call up. Um, anything you'd like to say to all the folks listening now and in replay? You know, I think I'd have a hard time adding too much to your summary. Uh, you, you've basically taken a lot of the themes I have in my own writing and expressed them very clearly. So uh, I'll just say I echo that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, Rainy from San Diego, actually. Um, okay, so a couple of real quick questions. I don't want to leave these hanging. Uh, someone wants you to say the name of your website again. Again, I'll say it in Canadian. And they want you to spell it. Sure. It's bullionbullscanada.com, and that's B U L L. I O N B U L L S C A N A D A dot com. Great. And someone said uh, Silver Wheaton is spelled W, you can spell it Silver Wheaton. W H E A T O N, Silver Wheaton. Okay, good. And I had another technical question. Oh, someone was asking earlier about, oh, hopefully I can find this question. I had 33 questions during this call. I'm trying to find the question where they're asking to spell another name. You know what, guys? I'm going to go through these questions and any of the other questions that we didn't get to, I am going to answer on the blog, timandjulieharris.com. So there you have it, guys. Thanks for joining us for this week's Superstar interview. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully some of you are now, I would say, cautiously optimistic. I started the call out by saying, what would you do now if you knew for sure that things were going to change significantly and many perspectives get significantly worse? And obviously, Jeff has laid out a very easy to understand explanation of why we're going to have inflation and maybe, you know, I'm not going to use the word hyperinflation because Jeff didn't use it, but we certainly could have a great deal of inflation, why there's going to be all kinds of radical changes in um, how we live. So guys, use this information now to prepare yourself. Jeff ended the call talking about where you can be putting your money to get uh, possibly a ridiculous return on your investment. I'm sure that Jeff will agree that none of us here are... um, I think, uh, well, Jeff is probably qualified to give this type of advice, but I'm not. I'm listening and learning as we go. Bottom line, guys, is do something with this information. Don't just sit on it. Be prepared. Don't be like one of the agents that 24 months from now, you're still looking around wondering when the market's going to return to normal. Be prepared. Learn what this market requires, guys, and you will be part of what's next. So on behalf of Julie, myself, and all the faculty and staff of Harris Real Estate University, Jeff, thank you sincerely for being our superstar this week. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. It's been a pleasure to be here. And thanks to all of you for joining us, and have a wonderful weekend.